Welcome to episode 13 of the Irish Fitness Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Hit Coffee and the Dublin Throwdown. Um, Hit Coffee have been a staple on the Irish CrossFit competition scene now for the last few years. They've been at the IFC for uh, a number of years, um, serving up their delicious brown liquid. And um, also recently have opened their own premises. Um, they travel around to a lot of the comps. They also support a lot of the charities. Christine and the guys give their leftovers from the, uh, the shop to the local homeless charities. Um, so they do a great deal. They also do um, athlete coffee mornings to support the athletes, which is fantastic. Um, the athletes travel on abroad, the, the games athletes. So uh, check them out the next time you're down at the IFC or any of the other um, local competitions. Big shout out to Christine and the guys. Um, this episode is all to you, also brought to you by the Dublin Throwdown. Um, the Dublin Throwdown has been a staple in the uh, competition calendar now for the last few years and has grown dramatically every year and is now one of the biggest competitions in Ireland. They have various different divisions. They have their, uh, their individual and also their teams as well. Um, at the moment, the qualifiers are going on. Um, there's three qualifiers out, two of them out at the moment, and uh, one is coming out tomorrow, I believe. And the registration to enter into the qualifiers is ending next week. So you can still get on that. You can submit your videos and uh, you can see if you can get into that competition. Great competition. Um, again, one of the, uh, the top ones in Ireland now at the moment. Shout out to uh, um, Adam and Andy for running such a great show. Um, next up, we're going to have uh, the one half of the Dublin Throwdown, Mr. Andy Ewington. He programs and coaches a lot of the athletes around the, uh, the country also. Really smart dude, really enjoyed talking to him, didn't we, Shane? Yep, I agree. So next up we have Mr. Andy Ewington. So today's first guest, we have the uh, programmer for the Dublin Throwdown and uh, coach the many athletes throughout Ireland, uh, Mr. Andy Ewington. Andy, how are you, buddy? Thanks for coming on the show. Uh Good, mate. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good. Good stuff. Um, you have a big event coming up soon, the Dublin Throwdown. Um, a few of our boys are doing the qualifiers and stuff like that, and it's going to be, uh, promises to be a massive event. Um, do you want to give us a little rundown on what's going on and what you have planned so far? Uh, I love to look at uh, the first two qualifiers that came out this week. Uh, yeah, it's been um, first year we're sort of running the, the qualifiers. Um, you know, just uh just get an idea of, of sort of where the athletes are that are um, that are going to be competing at the event helps us to sort of program uh, the final event sort of accurately. Mm-hmm. Um, we've obviously gone into a, a much bigger venue uh, this year uh, in the National Show Centre, so that's going to allow us uh, some good sort of flexibility in what we can what we can plan and program for the event. So brilliant! Uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting times. That was, uh, is the National Show Centre, is that where the Celtic series and uh, 5150 were in the past? I think, yeah, yeah, it was. It was, was it? Yeah, that's a great venue. Yeah. Uh, myself and a few of the lads yeah, competed yeah. up there before. The it's nice, there, it's yeah. nice to have a big uh, open area, concrete place like that, that you can uh, put the rig up and, you know, plenty of space and stuff like that. Um, do you want to give us a little history about the, uh, the Dublin Throwdown in the past? When did it start and how has it been growing through the years? Yeah, I was trying to think. I think it, it was either, must be about four years ago. Mm. Um, I think Adam came to me and asked me to program for a, a little competition he was running in his gym. Mm. Um, so he ran the first one over, I think. Like, uh, Zach George actually turned up to that one. And That's right, No yeah. one knew who the hell, <laughs> no one knew who he was. It was this big monster yeah, came yeah, over yeah. and just crushed, crushed it. Yeah. I... Um, so, yeah, and that gave us a bit of a taste for it. And so then we decided to uh, to run it again. And we decided, you know, we need to try and find a venue because while the gym worked, we couldn't get any spectators really in there. It was mm. a bit crammed. Um, so we moved, I think, to the, I think it was a, um, was it a guard club, I think, or a hurling club the next year? Um, that was out on the pitch, the wasn't it? It was out on the pitch in the uh, outdoors. Yeah, it was, yeah. Mm, and um, I remember that. I remember driving driving to the event and it started lashing rain. I was just like, oh, this is a disaster. 
<laughs> but uh, luckily it came right and we got the sunny day. But yeah, we didn't really want to mess with the weather again, so we mm. we went to the uh, the soccer dome. Mm. Thanks for our third year. Uh, that was a really big venue, really nice, good space, and that gave us the taste for like a nice big indoor sort of area. Yeah. Um, but um, they weren't able to host us this year, so we went looking around and because uh, each year we've kind of we felt like we've been kept growing and we keep seeing the event we keep like traveling to other events and with the um other events around ireland up in your game and you see how what the good quality events are we sort of wanted to keep trying to follow in that direction so we wanted to find a, a venue that kind of replicated that and we went to a lot of places that had a lot of wooden floors um mm. and things like that sort of great areas but again i, I just have a few nightmares of kettlebells or plates or barbells going through the old floor yeah so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that happened up in uh, Niall's competition up in chaos there a few years ago do you remember up in uh, yeah. dcu he had the platforms out but even with platforms you know what i mean when you're dropping them heavy weights uh, something is going to give and it's not going to be the platform or the barbell or the the, the dumbbell or whatever yeah, exactly. it is isn't it so generally yeah, so, uh, he had a bit of trouble with so, that yeah, so we went with the went with the show center like it is a big venue it's um you know it's it feels ambitious, like it's a um, it's a big step up for us. But it was just the safest venue in terms of having the concrete floors. It's got mm. the space um, for a huge event. It's it's got parking. It's you know it's got everything that we need to to run a big event. Um, it's in a nice sort of handy area to for most to get to as well. So mm. um, yeah, it sort of ticked all the boxes. Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, you said you're doing qualifiers this year. Could you give us a little rundown on the format of the qualification process, when it opened up and when the registration closes and uh, whatnot? Yeah, so it opened uh, on, the first one was released this month, the Monday just been, so mm. um, this week. I saw and... I saw Shane do, uh, was it part one you did, Shane, the other day? Yeah, I did, I did the both of them, but I did, um, yeah, I particularly liked the one with the row. Andy, yeah, big props to you for that. It was a nice oh, yeah. workout. Yeah, the two K road that leads into the the AMRAP. I, I like that kind of style. Now that's very creative as well. As in, there's two scores. You know, what was yeah, the, what was the yeah. thought process behind that? I think obviously it's a good separator for athletes. But were you looking for a particular stimulus with that or? Um, <laughs> pain, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, the, the main stimulus you'll get it from looked, that. Yeah. Looked, no, it's uh, painful. It's just a real challenge of how well you know yourself, um, because. You know, everyone can kind of row a 2K in and around the same pace. Yeah. Um, when you start getting into the into certain levels and like the RX sort of level, and what I wanted to do was obviously test how fast you could row a 2K, but then, you know, how fast are you willing to go because you still you still got you know a good 12 minutes of an of an AMRAP left over, so you just can't suffer through and just punish yourself with a with an all out 2K. Mm. You've got to kind of pace it, but you've also got to risk you know if you go too slow you end up at the bottom of the 2k pile yeah um and that can hurt you and then you know and um i've said yeah so that was the kind of idea is it's just a it's just a good little tester and it's hard to it's hard to repeat because you can't ultimately just get a a better score because you have to give up something Mm. generally you either have to go a little slower in the 2k or if you go faster in the 2k you might get less reps on the amrap you've got to gamble which one's going to get you the better score? So yeah, that, that uh, yeah, was. I mean, thought. that was definitely the battle in my head. Probably for a lot of the boys that are on that leaderboard now. Like, what do you do? Do you sell out on the roar and recover, or do you just kind of go for it? But uh, yeah, yeah, I love it. I love any kind of stuff like that that um, tests not only the athlete's ability to perform, but their ability to make a game plan. Mm. You know what I mean? You're very dependent on what other fellas are willing to do and how how hard you're willing to go on the first one. And then how much will that affect you coming into the the second one then as well? You know yeah. what I mean. And then I suppose you went you the contrast yeah. between the two of them was I thought brilliant as well with the just completely grunt work into high skill work like how skillful are you and the couplets classic CrossFit kind of couplets as well. Yeah, I sort of um, I sort of you know took the I guess the kind of Fran kind of format of the um, the squat you know the thruster type movement mm. uh, and the pulling movements and then. Um, that one there was a real kind of as well uh, getting an idea for for what where the athletes are at that are coming to the competition because um, there's the high school movement in there but you've also got to be pretty fit just to even get to those movements mm, yeah. um, 
and we started with a nice sort of easy one that you know most people can get through with the war balls and the pull-ups and it just starts to increase a little in complexity and um the reps come down so it's not too i mean i did a, i did a couple of variations of that um that was a bit longer and started at 21 15 9 and soon realized that was uh that was a bit too a bit it's rough fair. it's already um, a lot of reps didn't yeah. quite, uh, it's already a lot of reps i suppose if you're going for the 21 15 9 strain so bringing it back down to the, the 15 12 9 kind of gives people that like you were saying mm. that window to kind of get in and you get that done pretty quick and then it starts to hurt after that pretty bad <laughs> Yeah, and I think for the like for the elite guys, the top guys, you know, that the first couple of sections are almost just a warm up, yeah. um, and then for our intermediate category, like the idea for the intermediate qualifiers was, a, it's, it's all about that, you know, seeing where they're at and seeing because it's very hard to classify. I think truly what an intermediate athlete is. I say, um, boy, the the only the, in my opinion, the only fair division is the RX division, because you will see people yeah. in the scaled that are supposed to be in intermediate. And you will see the, them little sneaky RXers going into the intermediates <laughs> as well. You know what I mean? Um, how many? Yeah. What div- you, vision? Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Did you see the French throwdown qualifiers last year? I think they had a workout in intermediate. Yeah. It was like do four, forty-five pull-ups and forty-five thrusters any way you want. And Ooh. intermediate category, we're finishing that two ten to two fifteen. Jesus so doing, Christ! I'm like. <laughs> That's yeah. not an intermediate athlete. No, I don't think so. I think I saw even a few Irish athletes uh, that were in intermediate um, in the French throwdown last year, and I think they, they could have been RX, being honest. Um, I'm nearly sure I saw a few of them on a team, possibly. Yeah. But uh, I suppose that's, yeah. that's the nature of the game. If you don't set out exact standards, and uh, it's up to the coach and the athlete to be honest within themselves, mm-hmm. isn't it? Exactly, yeah. It's hard to... Yeah. Because we're not a, like a structured sport at the moment, um, I think it's very yeah. hard to define exactly what is what. Like it, say in martial arts, um, you're graded. So uh, when you go to competitions, uh, the brown belts and the black belts are heaped in with each other, or you know lower belts are heaped in with each other. It's up to the the, the sensei then will determine whether or not the uh, the pupil goes into a particular division. Yeah. But in CrossFit at the moment, yeah. I suppose it's the Wild West, isn't it, in terms of entry? Like people <laughs> they don't, people yeah. don't even talk to their coaches sometimes about entering competitions. Um, you know, they just uh, enter, they sign up online, and then they say, hey, coach, I'm in X division mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But again, you know, it's up to the, the, the athletes um, in terms of yeah. you know, where they're I mean, there's a few blurred like lines that. between even scaled into intermediate too. There is, you know, there the is. scale intermediate thing is a weird one as well. And then you're talking about RX intermediate, which is even worse. Yeah. If you have someone who's done five RX competitions yeah. and then you want to come into an inter competition, they're yeah. probably going to do pretty well. But yeah, uh, yeah. the scale one's weird because you have someone that could done it, literally could have done 10 scale competitions mm. and they still keep doing scaled. Do you see any solution to that, Andy? What, what's your opinion on that? Um, it's, yeah, I guess it, it's, you could, you could almost eventually have like, kind of like a league of some sorts or like if there was some, I mean, it's been like, I mean, I'm involved with the, the IF3 side of things as yes, well. And yes. it's something that's been spoken about with the, the different ranking levels. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like the belt system. We, you sort of compete and you, you sort of go onto the circuit and as you sort of get seen and you're known a bit more, it's, mm. it becomes a little bit more obvious and you just kind of have to set out, set out standards, but there's no real, it, it's very difficult because you can get someone who is very fit, uh, but not very strong. Yeah. So they can't do the weights at the RX level, but they're fitter than RX people in body weight movements. And then you get people who are very skilled, mm. but not very fit. And people who are very strong, but not very skilled. Yep. And, you know, there's, I mean, a lot of combinations of that. So There's, um, de- there's definitely a no man's the land the, there, isn't there? Yeah. There is, like, I even find myself, like, I've got the skills and the strength, but at the moment, my, like, I can't qualify. I think I gave up trying to qualify for RX events. I failed to qualify for about six on the trot, and I was just like, I can't go to intermediate because, you know, I can yeah. power clean 140 and do 15 muscle-ups. So I was no. like, I can't. <laughs> it won't, it won't <laughs> be It won't I'm be just ethical. Not, I'm just not fit enough. How old are you, um, how old so, are you Andy? Uh, 32. 32, you'd be, you'd be coming close to the Masters pretty soon then, another few years. Yeah. I know, cool. almost there. Almost, almost there. Almost there. Darren, 
Is you know, it, it doesn't make it any easier. Isn't it funny <laughs> how we... Uh, no, that's, it doesn't, because so all, all the fellas you're battling against now will still be coming in behind you. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't it funny how uh, you'd, yeah. be, you'd be almost wishing for a few extra years? Everyone wants to get younger. Yeah. But sometimes in CrossFit, <laughs> as we start pushing towards the Masters, we can't wait to get older. Yeah. I know. You just want to, you want to hit that next age bracket and, uh, yeah. you know, sort of get back into it. It's, um, absolutely. But yeah, the, absolutely. The, the difference in the divisions is is difficult and that's why this year we tried to kind of go with the qualifier instead of just selecting rx or intermediate it's kind of just like sign up and do the qualifiers and see where you fall and then um you know you kind of enter that division uh, but even then the, the person who if you take 20 teams the team that came 21st is almost an rx team and yep. they're going to do a lot better than a, a team who came at the bottom of the intermediate ladder and yes. so yeah it's uh, yeah I don't really see a solution to it to be honest no. um, so but uh, all I know is that I, I just want to keep trying to push people so that uh, you know they're, they're trying to, to compete at the event mm. they need to train and, and raise their level to, to be able to get there yeah I, t- I think you're right I think there's no easy solution I suppose the best thing is just um, an honest introspective look uh, from the athlete and then also from their coach as well to say, okay, you can do this. Possibly you should be in the next level or whatever it is. You know what I mean? And uh, how many divisions? Yeah. How many divisions do you have this year, Andy? Uh, well, we have the on the team side of things. We have the RX, the intermediate, and beginners. Mm. Um, we also got a few requests for masters, so we've um, we've got a masters team section. Yeah, um, fair play, buddy. And- Shout out to all the masters. I know, you've got to have the Masters in there, like, uh, you know, I went to, the, went to the games with my Masters athlete um, last year and, like, just had a blast with that, that whole crowd, like, it's, Brilliant. it was just such a good buzz. The Masters is uh, where really it's at, man, it. I'm telling you, there's a great uh, camaraderie and a kind of, um, I'm not going to say that we don't take things seriously, because we do, but there's a lot more of a kind of a relaxed attitude when you get to the Masters. The young, hungry Lions, like Shane and the boys, they're tend to to get a bit serious sometimes, which is fair enough. <laughs> but uh, there's nothing like um, having a buzz with uh, the older chaps as well, you know what I mean? I will definitely be up next yeah. year. I'm only trying to get myself back in order now, so uh, I'll be having a team <laughs> up with you next year. Or, if you want it, uh, give us an old um, individual Masters division as well. I would like to see that. Yeah, I'd love that. It's, it's almost... Yeah, it's, I, I like the way you're hanging on to the, the individuals. Uh, fair play to yeah. you for that. There's kind uh, of a... There's a, been a depth was, of individual competitions in the last uh, recent years. Yeah, um, that's, that's why we changed the format this year. Um, like, everything is... There's so many team competitions now, um, mm. and they're all, like, they're good competitions. Um, I found there was a lot aimed at the kind of scaled and intermediate division. The RX is kind of almost fading away a little bit. And, yeah, yeah. Um, like, last, last year, we, we didn't do the RX individuals, and or individuals at all, and that's really where, like, that's what I really enjoy. Um, same, same. So it was, it was a big thing for me to bring bring that back in. Um, even though it is only the RX category this year, it's, um, you know, it's definitely something that, because of the venue size as well, we needed to, um, we could only, we couldn't have too many divisions because then you run out of judges yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. To work on a, an event that we could run and run with a, a, a good amount of judges and not sh- sh- put a strain on that on the volunteer side of things, mm. um, we could only have the one individual division. But uh, yeah, looking forward to having it. No, fair play to you, man. It's easy to get um, caught up in the the money side of things and get everything team and all that. But we need individual competitions. If anyone is out there is listening. Um, I would like to see more of them. Um, I think hanging on to that individual spirit, because that's where CrossFit started, was as an individual sport. And um, because of, I think, um, obviously there's more money to be made in teams and stuff like that. And you'll probably get a, a better sign-up in terms of, because it's more fun and it's, you know what I mean, people are more inclined to do it as a team because they don't feel un- under as much pressure. So uh, shout out to all the uh, individual athletes. Um, you know, it's it's good yeah. to see that some people are still keeping that going. I'd recommend anyone doing it as well. Like you, you learn a lot about yourself when it's when it is just yourself. Mm, like yeah. it's just a it's just a great learning experience. Absolutely. You know, like you say, when you've 
when you've got a friend or you've got someone else there, it's there's a, that comfort zone and yep. being out on the floor by yourself. It's, is just, it's not a true it's a reflection of it. Um, it's definitely not. Yeah, I'd a, recommend you to experience that. Yeah, it's it won't be a true reflection of your own fitness on a team. Do you know what I'm saying? Like a real no. uh, yeah. heart and soul kind of a test. Because, again, you're reliant on uh, other people's fitness and you're reliant on are they training, are they getting their nutrition right, all that kind of stuff. You're almost dependent. You're, yeah. you're in a kind of a, an interdependent relationship with them when you're doing a team competition where when you're by yourself, that's it. If you fuck up, then it's your own fault. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's if you the... don't go to bed on yeah. time, it's your own fault. If you don't eat right, it's your own fault. If you don't do your five, six, seven sessions a week, mm. then it's your own fault. And you can be honest about things then as well. That's what I always loved about the, the, the uh, individual competitions is that not only are you competing by yourself and all that, but you're, you're, you're in your own head all the time building up to it as well. And you can't blame anyone yeah. but yourself. But if things go right... You can give all the credit to yourself then mm. as well. Do you know what I'm exactly, saying? Exactly, yeah. Big yeah, obviously, you have, yeah. Your, you have your coach and all that kind of stuff, but the real um, person on the podium is that individual. Mm. Yeah. You know, you can take uh, you can take credit for yourself. You don't, you don't have to, to share it with anyone or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And it's, um, yeah, that's a big thing, like coaching the, the individual athletes. Like, you, you see it, you know, you can, you can write the best, like, you know, you write the best program that you can and mm. you get someone who you can see is hiding. You know, they're making the little excuses all the time. They're yeah, yeah, yeah. staying out late and being like, oh, I didn't train well because of this. And you can yes. see that they don't want to put the full effort in because they're maybe a little bit scared of, you know, if they put full effort in, this is, they get exposed. Yes. This is as good as you are. Whereas, Absolutely. yeah, it's, um, but when you see the people put in the effort all the time and, they get the reward uh, of chasing their efforts. It's um, on that individual side of things. It's a uh, it's a different feeling, and it's a it's a great feeling. It's hundred percent, hundred percent. Do you um you know when you're coaching athletes, Andy? I know your um your program and form and stuff like that. What other uh, factors would you try and control with them? Do you advise them on nutrition? Um, sleep is one thing that we're looking at in uh, CrossFit Waterford mm-hmm. at the moment. We have a competition crew in here who uh, I'm programming for, and we're trying to get all of them now to go on sleep monitors and uh, test our sleep and stuff like that, and we're all trying to improve our sleeps. Is that something that you would look at when you're talking to your athletes also? Yeah. Um, I don't do a huge amount on nutrition myself. It's I give very very basic guidelines about you know, just getting a bit of protein and carbs and fats and yeah. a little bit of advice, but uh, I usually, um, if they really want, to focus on that, I usually pass them on to someone else who's a bit more passionate about it, um, mm. so they get good attention there. But sleep is sleep is one of my biggest things. Um, mm. Like you look at a couple of like little facts, um, like you take two hours two hours off a night of sleep, just get six hours or four or five hours of sleep instead of your seven to eight, and your ability to to process things like carbohydrates just crashes your mm. um, your endurance your like time to fatigue can reduce by up to 30% instantly uh, just with a couple of nights bad sleep. So, you know, if you want to perform poorly, just don't sleep. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do anything else. So. We're trying to get our guys. Uh, we have about 15 of us and we'd, we'd say about three or four of them are, are really poor sleepers, like life circumstances and stuff like that. So they're starting to wear the monitors now to kind of open, your, open their eyes about it. Like, as I said to them, if you can't measure it, then you can't fix it. So um, I'm hoping that that will pay dividends now uh, with uh, performance and, you know, their, their performances on their workouts and their weights and whatnot. Mm. I, I definitely think it will. Like, I think for most people, sleep is probably one of the biggest things that's, that's holding them back. Mm. Uh, you might be in bed for eight hours, but, you know, if, you're, if you don't have good sort of sleep hygiene, so, you know, you're not sleeping in a, a sort of cool room if you're, not sort of trying to turn off your screens um, an hour or so before bed and mm. trying to wind down and relax and actually get good sleep. And then mm. the other thing I focus on is people's breathing because if people have uh, sleep apnea, so if people are snoring, then mm. they're not actually getting into the good stages of sleep. Okay. So that's affecting them. So I try to uh, I try to improve their breathing and their meditation. I recommend that some people, you know, some of my people I've told them to, Put a little bit of tape over their mouth to try and 
keep their mouth shut and it helps them breathe through their nose and stop snoring. Um, that's an interesting that thing. That's an interesting thing to do in bed, put tape over your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a strange one. Are you um, sure this is about really sleep weird, now but... or is it something different? <laughs> <laughs> I might try. Hey, I might try that the next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give it a go. What do you yeah. think, Shane? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Sounds okay. like fun, Andy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it yeah. is. It's great fun. It, yeah. <laughs> but, it all uh, seriously. It, it can be amazing how how much that improves people's sleep when they actually start then uh, you know getting good sleep all through the night, mm. even though they stay asleep for the same amount of time. It's just you improve their sleep quality, yes. and um, they wake up starting to feel refreshed. That's, that's sort of one of the easy questions is when you wake up, are you tired or, mm. or do you feel refreshed? And if you don't feel refreshed, you haven't slept either enough or well enough. I agree, um, I agree. There's nothing yeah. like it, man. When you wake yeah. up in the morning and you know you had that good night's sleep, I use the, uh, the whoop strap. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it breaks. It basically gives me a little breakdown every uh, morning of my deep sleep, my REM and my light sleep, any disturbances or anything like that. Um, so it's really it's holding me accountable like if I'm trying to get my eight hours which is recommended for me I'm, I'm going to bed at least nine hours you know what I mean I'm getting nine and a half hours in bed just to get that eight hours you know which are disturbances yeah. we're getting up we're just turning over all that kind of business so I think people think that oh yeah if I go to bed like you said for eight hours that I get eight hours sleep you don't the average person misses out on about at least a minimum of an hour every night with just waking up turning mm. over you know all that kind of stuff not in REM sleep yeah they're Rapid not they're not getting into that deep sleep mm. how many hours a week or yeah. a night would you would you sleep Shane? oh it's, it was really good before i went back to college and so college students will identify with this i'm a third year college student now so like mm. i was on placement here so i got to sleep eight to nine hours a night yeah. train all day easy podcast by podcast day by <laughs> podcast by night um so it was easy for me eight to nine hours is fine now it's I'm working early shifts in here. I'm in college during, in the mornings too. And between that, it's probably the bones of six hours. Six know? hours. I think it all, it all adds up during the week sometimes. If you're on like, I feel like people are on the shift work, like mm. three, three shifts will, uh, will identify as yeah, well. Yeah, it builds yeah. up to something. So you Absolutely. might have five hours, four hours, two hours, three hours, five hours. And then you get a Saturday where you can sleep in and it's like 12 hours. And it's like 11 hours. Your, your sleep yeah. dead. Yeah, sleep death is that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, what uh, Andy was touching on there as well, um, how the effect it has on you. There was a research study done on people who, um, I think they sleep deprived people for like two weeks. Mm. I'm, not exactly, I'm not sure now the numbers exactly how what they slept. And I think a number of them in the control study showed up as pre-diabetic just from the lack of sleep. Go away. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. So, so there's more studies going into that. It's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. How yeah. much yeah. of a... Uh, uh, they actually pulled that. They've actually found this now after only a week. After a, a week? week? Yeah. And fuck. Yeah, they, it was initially two weeks and they've, they've pulled it back now and found that after, after a week of just losing a couple of hours of sleep. Um, so going from eight to six hours sleep was enough to turn someone pre-diabetic pre in a week. Yeah. There's, probably, there's probably tens of millions of shift workers around the world and that are in that kind of Yeah, that they're in that category and they're always floating they? in there too. Because it's like jet lag every, yeah. every three yeah, weeks. I was one much. of myself, I did shift for a long time. Yeah. And uh, on the nights, you just feel like a zombie going around the place. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a it's like there's that old like table of like nutrition, sleep, whatever you want to put on it. It looks like sleep is kind of making its way up to be mm. like the number one. I yeah. even hear CrossFit Games that needs to talk about. Like they're, they're only competitive so with their important. sleep. You know? So important. They have, with the Whoop bands and all that. We keep mentioning Whoop. Hopefully you get a sponsorship. Yeah, yeah. Some Shout point, out but, to Whoop. <laughs> Shout um, out to Whoop. Shout out to but Whoop. But it's almost, there's like leaderboards for sleep and stuff like that, which I think is really yeah. cool. You know, so. mm. The amazing thing with those uh, Whoop bands is looking at even how alcohol affects um, people's sleep. Like, <laughs> you know, you think you, if you, for some people it's as little as like two standard drinks is enough to mm. just completely wreck their sleep and recovery for for a night so yeah. um that's a that's a really interesting eye opener for some 100 percent. i i was i was uh so i got the whoop band in i think it was uh november and i was tipping along everything was going good i deliberately took it off for the week of christmas because I didn't want to know what was going on because I was drinking so much. I was like, fuck that. Good luck. I yeah, don't yeah, want to know. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I put it back on then when I stopped the booze in that Christmas. And uh, it's been, you know, getting better since my HRV is going up the way and my resting heart rate is going down. 
Uh, but I would 100% agree with the alcohol thing. You definitely don't sleep right. So you don't, no, it's more you, passing you out wake up, yeah, Even if you're yeah. in bed and you're, you're coming to us for like, I don't know, 10 hours or something, you wake up and you're still tired. Yeah, Obviously, you're, you're, you're not recovered. Over, but yeah. No, you're not. It's dehydrating your body. It would be well, interesting to see do you get into any kind of deep sleep or REM when you're... Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see a boost. study done on uh, crossfitters that do a whole day of competition, mm, then go out drinking. Then hit the thing. And how hours. bad that is in your body, you know? <laughs> That's like an Irish thing, isn't it? It's like yeah, you have to do... A competition for eight hours, yeah. you're, and you're on low sleep anyway, probably because you're probably yeah. traveling for it. And then you're going to get a pizza and then 15 bottles up in you as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great recovery. Yeah, strategy. great recovery. <laughs> Any scientists out there want to yeah. run a study on that? I'd like 100%, to see. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. When is the next um, qualifiers coming out, Andy? And he, also, uh, how, how do people how do people register again? So where do they go, and uh, when, when do they have to register, boy? All right, so on Competition Corner, uh, you'll find us on there, or if you on our Instagram, uh, there's a link in our bio to, to sign up for the, for the qualifiers. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, mainly mainly focused on qualifying for the RX division this year. So if you want to do that, you can sign up uh, before Sunday next week. You need to be signed up and have the three, three qualifiers uh, complete. So there's two released already. Mm. We're just going to release one next week. Um, uh, we were going to release two, but uh, we've decided just to to go with one. Mm. Um, and then after that is complete, and so that would be the 2nd of February. Um, by the 9th of February, we'll have all the RX teams and individuals all sorted out, and then we'll be offering the uh, remaining spaces onto the, into um, the intermediate category uh, on, on about the 9th, 9th or 10th of February. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, when are when is the live event then? What date is that? Twenty uh, eighth of March. Twenty eighth of March. So it's a, yeah, it's a Saturday. And uh, where can people get tickets for that? Can they show up on the day, or will you be selling them online, or watch the the story there? Yeah, we'll do. Uh, I'd say the the spectator tickets will go on sale probably the same time as the the uh, remaining tickets. So the tenth of February, we'll look to start uh, getting those on sale and getting those sorted. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, hopefully, the young chap here qualifies. <laughs> we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed. The oh, chain yeah. will get up to you. Having a go at it. Um, Andy, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you, buddy. Is there anyone you want to give a shout out to before we wrap it up? Oh, well, I've got to mention Adam. Yeah, yes, he, yes. Know, he shout out to Kramer. Uh, he, he, uh, he said his, his laptop, was broke, down, so laptop was broke down, so he couldn't do it. He does a lot of organising, so... Yeah, and anyone else? Is there anyone else you'd like to give a shout out to? And also, are you looking for volunteers and judges? Would you like anyone to volunteer and judge for the day? Uh, yes, we'd love, we'd love we'd love a lot of people to come and volunteer and judge now, for the day. Uh, we have a good crew. Like I've been speaking with Elaine. Um, she's been helping me all get get some judges organised with that. So um, there is that. Uh, and then, yeah, if anyone else would like to. To volunteer or help us out on the day, um, you know these competitions can't run no. without the without the volunteers. So um, the the more we can get, you know, the better we can make it run. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. Great. And where could they, uh, if a judge or a volunteer wanted to get in contact with you, uh, where could they give you a buzz? Uh, Instagram or Facebook's the the best option. Um, actually, we're going to do a post up on Instagram um, in the next day or two, uh, mm. asking for with a registration link in that to, to sign up to sort of uh, register your interest to, to help us out on the day. Excellent, excellent. And will there be uh, vendor opportunities also, Andy? Are you taking on vendors for yeah. any any type of... Yeah, yeah, that's all coming through at the moment. Um, we're just trying to work through a couple of uh, sort of potential sort of headline sponsors or sponsorships. Mm. So, you know, when you once we get those sorted, we'll know who, who and what we can ask for. At the moment, we've got... Uh, the hit coffee mm. who was with us last year they're, they're Brilliant. on board so we'll definitely have coffee um, supplied which is probably the main thing uh, excellent yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah cheers to hit coffee cheers to hit coffee <laughs> all right brother yeah. uh, we'll wrap it up and um, we're going to talk to you soon will you be coming down our way in july uh, for the ifc i actually do want to make it down i uh, couldn't make it last year mm. um but i do i do like the event i think the last time i was there i actually competed yes um Back in the day. So uh, I don't think I, yeah, back in the day when I thought I could, uh, thought I could keep up with everyone. I've hey. uh, <laughs> gone to coaching recently, but yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get down there with a, with a few athletes and uh, 
and have a good day down there. Excellent, excellent. Brilliant. All right, my friend. Um, best of luck with the qualifiers and also the live event. I'm sure it's going to be a great day, and uh, we shall talk to you soon. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. See you later, Thanks, Andy. Andy boy. See you again. See you later, guys. Cool, and that was a wrap. That was an interesting conversation, yeah. wasn't it? One of Ireland, I think. Uh, I think he's one of Ireland's uh, top coaches. Yeah. He's an excellent programmer. Really knows his stuff. You know what I mean? He's he's taken care of a few gyms and a lot of athletes around the place as well. So I'm sure the program for the live competition will be. Yeah, that's why I was excited to do uh, qualifiers and hopefully get to this competition. Just because I know it'll be well done. It'll be mm -hmm. well programmed and obviously be a good mix of uh, people to compete against too and the facilities. Yes. Uh, there now is huge. The venue is huge up there. If anyone's ever been that It is, it is. Shout out to Alan Fitzpatrick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's it, buddy. Up after the break, we have Mr. Colm O'Reilly. And today's second guest, we have the owner of CrossFit Ireland and OG of Irish CrossFit, Mr. Colm O'Reilly. Uh, morning, Colm. How are you? I'm great. It's uh, it's good to be on again. So yes, soon. yes, yes. You're, uh, just to let the, the folks know at home, this is actually your second appearance in uh, 24 hours, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we had uh, some technical difficulties recording some... yesterday, so yes, we yes. only found out afterwards. So. We only found out afterwards. So to, to give you a little insight, folks, um, we did uh, one of our longest kind of um, podcast slash interviews with uh, Colm yesterday. He was good enough to come on the show. And um, it was absolutely fantastic. We'll be going overall again today and hopefully even uh, delve into some other stuff. But we, we went through the whole interview. Myself and uh, Shane gave ourselves the high five at the end as we normally do. And uh, I went and looked at the camera and had it switched off at a minute and 21 seconds, I believe. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't a fantastic uh, start of the day, was it, Shane? No, but uh, we had a really good chat with Colin anyway. He gave us some good advice on mental health, yes. which we're going to delve into today again, obviously. And, yeah. uh, Help us actually help us deal with it. So yeah, and I found that the stuff that we did talk about with Colm yesterday helped me get over the disappointment yeah. and the anger of the, the the camera shutting off. So um, it was a worthwhile thing in itself, you know what I mean. Yeah. And we picked up a lot of good stuff. But again, we're here today. It's Sunday morning. Colin has graciously agreed to come back on the show and um, give it up his time on a Sunday morning, which I'm really appreciative of, Colin. Uh, so we'll go through everything again today. So um, again, thanks very much, buddy. No, my pleasure. Good. And uh, look, these things happen. You they do. Give yourself. Yes, yes. There's no point in crying over uh, spilt, <laughs> spilt milk, as they say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Carl, I um, said in the intro, you are the, um, the owner of Cross Waterford, the first ever. CrossFit Ireland. CrossFit Ireland, I believe. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the owner. It's Sunday morning, sorry. <laughs> uh, the owner of CrossFit Ireland, the first ever affiliate in Ireland. Um, could you give us a little rundown on your background in CrossFit, how you got into it, how you started CrossFit Ireland, how you got that lovely uh, that name as well, which is, I've never seen it before with a country. Have you? Is, is there any other country names, CrossFit? Um, you know, I'm not sure, but um, at the time I registered, I believe I was like the sixth affiliate in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I think there was four in the UK. <clears throat> one on the Air Force Base in Germany, and I think I was number six, but I'm not sure, but it was early enough, early enough days. Yeah. And uh, I discovered CrossFit because I was doing martial arts, and a friend of mine had told us about CrossFit, and he tried it for a few months and noticed he was getting good strength gain for the, for the Jiu-Jitsu game. So I said, right, whatever happens Monday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the dot-com workout. Uh, this is back in the day when only dot-com was your way to go. Uh, it was Cindy. You know, seemed doable on paper, full of push of squats, I can do all that. Mm. I remember getting to the first round and it's like 40 odd seconds. Um, now, I'm not saying I was holding up proper CrossFit standards at all. Uh, then I said, oh, this is pretty comfortable. About two minutes in, I realized I had 18 minutes of uh, discomfort to go, but I was, I was hooked straight away. Uh, started devouring all I could about it. I figured this was the future. Um, and then, um, Took a chance on uh, getting an affiliate license and was very graciously granted one. So started from there. We really didn't have a clue what I was doing at the start. You know, I was uh, working nine to five, so opening up the gym before and afterwards. And when I say gym, I mean dingy little hole in Halla. Like, um, just grew from there. And I'm very lucky that I've had the opportunities I've had to cross it. 
Yeah, you had, you had a fantastic um, start and you, you were right at the very beginning of not only in Ireland but in Europe as well, as you said. Um, I discovered CrossFit in 2009 in Australia and I uh, came back to Ireland in 2010 and I remember coming back and I paid very close attention to your website. I used to go on it every day. I would look at your workouts and um, I would see what your program was and I would see what you were doing and all that kind of stuff. So you helped me um, immensely at the start also, you know, to just kind of see what was, what was the way to do things because I had no idea. I was doing it out of a shed. Um, I had seen obviously um, a great gym in Australia and I trained there and seen what way they did things. But it was hard on the Irish kind of landscape to, uh, to figure out, you know, my way and all that kind of stuff. So um, thank you very much for uh, setting up at the start and, and showing all the rest of us how to do things. Okay. Well, I'm not sure I can take all the credit, but if, if someone learned through my uh, stroke of luck, or like, uh, like a good friend says to me, he said, never confuse a good stroke of luck with genius. Yeah, I yeah. think I got in at my time and uh, was plucky and lucky enough that like I could stumble my way through it for the first few years. I know you couldn't uh, couldn't get away with a service or a facility like that now. No, absolutely not. Definitely not. The, things have uh, changed dramatically, I think, between the, the kind of stone age in Irish CrossFit and the way things are now. Things are headed more towards like a lot more systemized approach and people expect a lot higher level of service. And, you know, just the gyms now are businesses rather than hobbies, I think, aren't they? Or the good ones are anyway, the surviving ones. Yeah, and I suppose it's like uh, if you looked at the games in twenty nine or two thousand and nine, you know, uh, like the, the winning snatch there wouldn't uh, the female and the males, the men's now would just the women's snatch and the men's back then, the females would do as part of their as part of the map. Yeah, they would. You know, and it, everything's gone on like time. It was like a sub tree plan was you were the fittest person on earth, and now there's loads of people. Not even straight into the sanctional qualifiers with that. So mm. it's just, the standard keeps going up and it's, it's moved from sort of warehouse gym to more and more of a retail feel. You still have a little bit of the warehouse feel to it, but you want everything polished and clean. It's crazy to think how far the sport has come, especially because I'm only 24, so all I've ever seen is YouTube videos. Yes. Whereas you guys were kind of the OGs of like bringing it into the country. But yeah. if you watch those old videos, it's like, it's almost like, I think they called it the Woodstock of fitness. So it just looked like yes. a lot of people in the field doing thrusters and there's the dirt everywhere and everyone's just screaming at you. Now it's just like, there's such a professional feel to it. And that goes from like the sport all the way down to like what we're doing in the gym as well. Mm. You know, like the gyms are now a bit more commercial. Whereas it, like you were saying, it was just like- It's a, a massive difference. Your mom's difference. garage or whatever it's it was. It's a huge difference between um, say 2007, they were able to show up and you could pick whatever order you wanted to do the workouts in. <laughs> You just go over and you do this over here, do that over here, and then 2008, a bit more structured. They had the every second counts format. Mm. Then 2009, it was still at the ranch, got bigger again. Uh, 2010, then on to uh, Car Carson, and then uh, what we see now, the incarnation of it in, in Madison, yeah. you know what I mean? So there's a massive, massive jumps over the years, I think. And, and the field of athletes now with the uh, the amount of national champions going as well. Do you like that, call? Do you like the new format and the fact that we have our national champions and stuff? Uh, I like the national champions format. Uh, I would like it if it was the bare minimum criteria to qualify for the games, like you had to do a sanctional afterwards, or there was a few bottleneck workouts that were right at the start that started with a 225 snatch or a a strict ring month look that would weed out a lot of national champions there. While it's great to represent the company, uh, country and at the world stage, um, I would also like if the vetting procedure was a little bit different. I know we've had the, uh, the issue with somebody who has a name that will remain nameless on this podcast uh, submitting, submitting score. Yes, yes. Um, but if you have to submit your videos weekly for public review, I think that would help. Yeah. There's definitely like Sam would look at Mickey and PD and Jamie, and Jamie would look at Sam and Mickey and PD and uh, Arminus and everyone. But no, Arminus is uh, representing the career. Mm. Um, I think that would help because then you'd have instant review and if enough people flag the video, it would go to HQ. But I also get that sport isn't exactly focused, so resources aren't going to be allocated to, uh, to a loss maker like that. Yeah, I think. Uh, it's exciting, like you, you know, I like Mark Watson, my Fraser says, it's like, tell me the format, and I'll figure out what I need to do. Mm. You know, we can waste energy 
bitch and moaning about what the format is, whether national champions or sanctionals or regionals is the way to go, but you just have to play the sport and slide. Yeah, I agree. I think um, obviously the cream will obviously always rise to the top or whatever, but I would love to see what you suggested there. Um, if you're in, say, contention to be a national champion, maybe a weekly review of the video, you know, so people can see what's going on and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be um, while the, the scoreboard is still open, but definitely afterwards. So people can see and there's less of a kind of an issue then with anyone scoring, mm. isn't it? Um, if the video is... Well, I, I guarantee you, if, if I ask Neil Laverty to see these videos right after score submissions closed for 20.1, he'd show me that. And I'd show him mm. Sam. And uh, myself and Neil have talked about this just a little bit that, like, if HQ look at Sam's video and say, oh, there's two no reps here that I did good in good contest, that's fine. That's part of the sport. That's like offside in soccer or rugby. You know, you're playing that line of the sport and that's fine. But um, if you're not willing to put your videos out there, it's, uh, it's a big red flag in my opinion. Yeah, it is. It says something. It says that if you're not willing to stand behind your work, why wouldn't you want to put a video out af after a score submission? You know, it'd be uh, quite strange. You know, a deal. I'm looking at I'm looking at the uh, the Friday attempt before the Monday attempt to make sure the angle's good and mm. does everything look good on camera? Remember, you're recording this on an iPhone from 10, 15, 20 meters away, depending on the workout. So it has to look proper like that. You know, depth in the wall ball, wall ball target, lockout on a pistol. They all look different on video, and you have to make sure they're that good on standard on video as well as live. Mm. Because you know. Someone who isn't a friend of myself or is competing directly against Sam is going to want to, want to find all the potential no reps in his performance. Mm -hmm. And that would be true. Like if I looked at, if I looked at Mickey Smith's or Stephen Savage's video, I'd be looking for any chance I could say to flag a no rep because yeah. I'm looking out for my athlete. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's all part of the sport and that's all, that's all fair game. Like I said, the, uh, the uh, throwing up of questionable scores and uh, taking videos down from offline hence the rate with more questions than an answers. It does, it does. Do you, um, you know when Sam is doing his uh, open workouts, do you judge him? Do I touch him? Do you, no. <laughs> do, you ju do you judge him? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, 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 that's, I a, a, that's a question for another podcast. Give him a pat on the back or something. Not, not as much a hugger. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've always good. Shout out to Sam. Derek on the video because Derek is, is, is backing up on that as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll stand over my call. If someone disagrees with my call, mm. that's, that's fair enough. But yeah, we've always done it. We always talk strategy, go through it before. I mean, he's grown so much this stage that like, he'll know what strategy and where he's at. And it's just me reminding him of what speed he's going and all that. And then <clears throat> after the first attempt, I'll do a time analysis and see if there's anywhere where I think we can build up speed, he'll go away and have a think and change his strategy mm. and then uh, and then it tends to be the Monday. Occasionally there's a there's a tree and done, but most of the, most of the time it's two attempts. Excellent. You don't let him in on a Saturday night then when the gym is empty with his girlfriend to do an old bit of judging. <laughs> if, look, if Sam wanted to come in on Saturday night with his girlfriend and train, knock himself out. You know? <laughs> I'm only joking. Uh, Shane? Oh, yeah. uh, sorry, Carl. So you want to get into the side of the mental health plan, so the Instagram page and Facebook page okay. that you have online. Um, do you want to just give everybody kind of a broad overview of how that got started and the kind of stuff that you post on that? Okay, uh, so I suppose it's best, I give, it's best I give a good bit of history on that because otherwise it, it will just look like I'm spreading out platitude. So yep. uh, I, I suffered from mental illness through, through most of my life. I had a suicide attempt when I was 17 that I wrote about a few years ago. And I'd like to say that like it was just that, that glitch as a teenager, but you know, on reflection throughout my twenties and early thirties there was a lot of a lot of emotional issues there and a lot of misunderstanding about what was going on in my own head and my own emotions. Um, and I always used to fall into the trap, which actually a lot of people do, is that if I could just make everything in my world right, I'd feel okay on the inside. So you take very strong cues from your external world if you're your gym is going well, if your job is going well, if your relationship is going well, if you have money in the bank, if you have the nice car, you're clearly worth something. And if you don't, you're clearly a piece of shit. Um, I don't have a very extreme way of putting it, 
Mm. And then when I, you know, when I broke from business partners in 2014, that was obviously a very, uh, very long drawn out affair. Uh, different views of how to run the business and then the legal issues of separating from all that. And then when I started up where I am here now, there was, uh, there was another breakdown moment essentially where I just got all overwhelmed with everything. And Derek, my business partner, you know, mine at the gym while I went to see a psychologist. That psychologist uh, referred me on to Theatre House. At the time, I had no idea what Theatre House was. It was only when I got there I realized it was a suicide prevention counseling as well. So obviously the, the big red flags were there and the, the big black dog was sitting pretty heavily on my chest. And uh, luckily, very much thanks to thanks to Derek and uh, my best friend Patrick, and uh, I got to give Jamie Lawler from Swords and Post One Fifty a lot of a lot of respect for this. They were they were great friends to all that. I got through that, and then I said, right, that has to be. I need to I need to fix this. This can't wait for the next cycle to come around again. I can't wait for this next thing to come around and derail a business or damage someone's life or I go to that you know final fatal solution again. So I started working really hard on that, started researching into what is the difference between mental illness and mental health. Because unfortunately when people say mental health, they tend to be talking about, you know, stress, overwhelm, addiction, depression, anxiety, all these things wrapped up with their mental illness. And they're not thinking about, you know, positivity, optimism, self-assurance, self-reliance, gratitude, <clears throat> your level of confidence. Um, be it task specific or just in yourself. And so kind of working towards that and spent a lot of time building up myself and then teaching what I knew to other people, what worked, what didn't work. Um, fast forward then to 2019, last year I was away in Chicago with friends and they mentioned that entrepreneurs and gym owners tend to have much higher rates of depression and addiction than the regular people, you know, someone same age, same same lifestyle circumstances, but not a, a business owner. And I said, well, I can help with that. So started working really seriously over the summer, trying to codify everything I'd learned, to put it into a, a package that people could start developing a self-care, a mental health, emotional health routine. And then, and basically, the time it takes you to drink your coffee or brush your teeth, even. Yeah, I love the way. Um I've been following your, your posts on um, Instagram and Facebook in particular because they leave you go a little bit longer and stuff. I love the way you're giving us all kind of practical strategies and they're not too long either. You know, they're like your videos are maybe two or three minutes long and they're very actionable things as well. You know what I mean? Little small things like just getting into routines and stuff. Um, some good ones on meditation there recently as well. Um, was that a conscious thing that you wanted to keep the videos kind of in the shorter package and just give people like a, a more regular drip dose rather than a big one hour long thing and then not see you again for another month or whatever? Absolutely, absolutely. So I was thinking about this yesterday, like uh, going to psychologists is kind of like going to the dentist and we might need to do that every couple of months. But we still have to brush our teeth and we still have to floss every day to take care of our teeth. Mm. And taking care of our mind is no different. Now the idea behind the, the short videos was uh, Number one, it was just getting practice in, but then when I thought about it, like we live in that Instagram fast attention culture, mm. so why try and fight that? And a lot of the apps out there that are very good requires you to start sitting down for 10 or 20 minutes, which if you're starting off is a lot, like that's a lot to deal with, it's a big time investment, you're not sure if it's worth it, whereas a one minute investment anybody can do, and amazingly, like I've had... Uh, someone I work with, like get over his fear of flying and his anxiety around flying just by spending that one minute quiet time at the start and then his work day. So the idea behind the one minute thing was make it really punchy and actionable because most people don't know how to articulate that they may be suffering from sort of, sort of stress or overwhelm or anxiety, even at a low level state. Mm. And then the next excuse is, well, I don't have the time and I don't know what to do. So the one minute quick actionable steps is hopefully taking care of the, uh, the time and the, well, actually, what do I do? It seems. Mm, yeah, I think that that's the best way to go these days is kind of shorter, more regular drips of information that people can work on there and then rather than a whole big strategy thing where they might miss a lot of stuff. Um, so if you're giving it to them every few days or once a week or whatever, then it's, um, it's more doable for people, isn't it? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we like there's there's certain things we can't outsource. We can't outsource our fitness. Like we have to sweat and put our body under strain, be that lifting weights or doing yoga or going for hill walks or doing CrossFit or weightlifting. Like you need to do something physical. Uh, you need to take care of your health. You need to sleep and eat right, and you need to take care of your happiness. And that's sitting down with your brain and learning to separate yourself from those stories that are just running constantly. Mm. Sure. And uh, Colm, how much would you say social media would play into someone's mental health? So if someone's spending that six hours a day on their phone or looking at the screen constantly, do you think that plays into how they feel and like the story they're telling themselves in their head? And what do you think about that? It, it absolutely, it absolutely can. I'm not going to say social media is is evil. I think that's a cop out, and that's just a nice soundbite that people can throw out there. Um, <clears throat> Like, uh, I, I deleted Facebook off my phone because I knew I was just checking it routinely 20, 30 times a day, and it wasn't helpful for me. Now, it wasn't causing any comparative damage. Like, I wasn't looking at other people and going, oh, my God, they're so much more successful or better looking or in better shape or can lift heavier than me. Mm. Um, it wasn't because of that. It was just that I knew this was a habit that wasn't helpful. And it's true as well in, you know, with Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat and all that, that you can drag into it because it is a quick hit. It mm -hmm. is a lovely hit. And, you know, you, you check your phone and you don't know if you're going to see posts from your favorite people or you're going to see something which enrages you. So it is that lot of system. Um, but if, you, if you're checking it, if you're on your phone six hours a day, well, there's a chance that you could probably spend that time a little bit more useful. But I don't want to say that social media is evil because, like, I post on social media mm. to get a positive message out. Mm. I check up with a lot of friends that don't live close to me on social media, and that's a great way to connect. So it's all about how you use it. If it's if it's a mindless or it's a, a destructive addiction, yeah, it's very bad. If you're using it to deliberately go on and check on your friends and touch base with people, mm. then it could be very powerful. I mean, we wouldn't be on this podcast right now, and we really hope it's recording, if <laughs> you know, I weren't friends on Facebook and yes. he, didn't, uh, he didn't message me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There, is a, there is a lot of positives. I don't want to say it's just evil, but yeah, you, you can get into it. And um, Cal Newport, who like wrote Digital Minimalism, bit preachy of the book, but he said there's a difference between connection and conversation. Mm. And I can ping someone a message online on, you know, slide into their DMs and uh, on Instagram or whatever <laughs> and chat to them. Or, you know, on Facebook message you can chat to them and that's that's connection. But you've also got to have that face to face in person conversation with people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that's where it really 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 is. Like I always attribute it to the gym. Like we get we get quite a few clients in here that would message us maybe mm. Facebook or Instagram. Yes. But it's not until they come in the door and they get face-to-face -face interaction and we look them in the eye and use their name yeah. that they actually want to stay here, I feel like. You know? Yeah, that's more human, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, a quite un and it's an unnatural thing just to read to each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? You type something, I read it. Then I type something, you read it. You know what I mean? It's, it's a weird way of dealing with things. Even this now with the face-to-face. -face, well, we're face-to-face -face with you. You're not face-to-face -face with us. <laughs> um, even that... I can read your emotions and stuff like that and it's a lot clearer and things so it's way more important isn't yeah. it to have the visual side of things and For even sure. the audio because you can hear uh, on a telephone call you can hear the person's emotion coming across mm. even though uh, they're saying the same words as they would have when they typed it you can definitely hear their tonality and stuff like yeah. that and you can read people better then and it, it develops more of a yeah. connection that, i it? mean that's what like reading personalities is it's very hard when you're talking to someone mm. you know like, the big thing now is obviously like tinder and even mm. talking to people on instagram yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. so when you have people actually interacting yeah it's, it's uh, they're just uh, they're mo way more shy i've noticed mm. than ever before yeah yeah like yeah. looking looking at each other we're, we're, you know? we're crossing off this barrier you know people yeah. can get to know someone now without uh, never even hearing their voice yeah do you know what i mean it's which crazy. is kind of a weird weird thing but um, that's the age we're living yeah. in, I suppose, isn't it? It's yeah. it, and it's not, it's not inherently, it's not inherently evil. I don't, you know, I don't believe 99.9% .9 of the people out there are inherently bad. It's just, mm. it's just a strategy. And because it satisfies like a deep evolutionary thing of the need for a surprise, which is basically what a message is, surprise yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah. Um, like an Instagram is a surprise. But, you know, you could, you could argue the same for, uh, CrossFit or any other physical activity that if someone is can use it as a constructive or a destructive way in their life at mm. various points, yeah. you know, 
that person who's ignoring shoulder niggles, I was that guy, so I can speak to this, mm-hmm. and just keeps hammering the lifts instead of like doing the rehab and the boring work or taking rests. But that person hitting five um, mashup Metcons every day and not taking a rest and you know, still eating a Burger King, mm-hmm. that's, that's a destructive way to use CrossFit. Yes, you know, yes. it's a sport we all know. Yeah. Or, or it's a person who comes in and they use it and they acknowledge that it's good for their health and they push on the days they can and they pull back on the days they can. They're a, they're a much healthier approach to it as well. Mm. So they, you can you can use all these things as, as constructive as destructive. The important thing is that you've got to be conscious about what you're doing, and you can't be conscious if you haven't taken any time to step back from your day to day and start to look at it. Mm. Because you're not your thoughts and you're not your feelings. You're the observer of them. So getting caught up in them, like, am I am I eating this? pizza because like I really want to enjoy and savor this pizza because, you know I really want to at the end of the week and that's a lot different than I'm eating this pizza because uh second I don't feel like fucking and what's the point in eating salad yeah 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 it's like everything isn't it like the social media is like it's like alcohol you know it's a nice little thing to have every now and then but you know what I mean you don't want to be doing too much of it because it can be as you said destructive and um another thing you t- touched on there was um self-talk um, I, I know as you talk about that in your videos as well um, I know that everyone has it and um, it's always with us because it's always in our mind and um, it can be a hugely powerful tool and it can inspire us and push us on but it can also be hugely destructive as well and I think what's come at the light with um, kind of mental illness and, and again what you said mental health is that a lot of people are going around and are beating themselves up continuously in their head um, I know I've done it, you know, we all do it in times and time, and it, if there's something going on in your life, then it can be even more so. And what would you say to people who are being very hard on themselves? I'm sure you have people in the gym that you hear them complain, and they just seem to be a lot more difficult in their own head than other people. What would you say to try and, like, help those people? Um, so, again, first of all, you've got to recognize it for what it is. And, you know, if you're not <clears throat> taking the time to observe yourself and just notice what your what your patterns and habits are you'll never notice just how destructive you are mm. and it's, it's like that it's like that extra couple of carbs you have each day that lead to weight gain or a heart attack 50 years down the line or it's like um you know the lack of mobility making those squats so much tougher for you to make it making an answer back to fitness since we're on a fitness podcast yes yes um, so self-talk is is huge. If you if you get a human being to think of nothing, their brain will start to think of themselves. And here's the crazy thing: is like this is neuroscience to be proven. This isn't even on the level of psychology. This is literally neuron firing. Seventy-five percent of our default mode talk is negative. It's threat looking. It's threat assessment. So you're. It worked for us back when we were chasing saber two tigers and running after woolly mammoths, but it doesn't work for us in modern society. And that's where we need to actually start consciously being good to ourselves. So there's a few, uh, a few examples of all that. The first one is the Jason Khalifa one. He talked about if you're in a Metcon and you're not talking to yourself like the best, most positive coach in the gym, you need to look at that. Like you go, oh my God, I can't believe I broke up those ball balls. I can't believe I'm so far behind in the class. Like you're so unfit. How are you breathing so heavy? That's, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. And the argument that, oh, like, I only succeed because I'm so tough on myself, doesn't hold water. Like, Matt Frazier, the best in the world, um, at our sport, doesn't talk to himself like that. Neither does Pia Claire Toomey, he's the best in our sport. You go outside our sport, LeBron James, the psychology they do with um, top-level golfers or Serena Williams in tennis or the All Blacks, they do not talk to themselves like that. Mm. You've got to coach yourself. Uh, Jordan Peterson writes that you should treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. Again, a um, very funny story of a guy I know who every day, without fail, will make sure his wife takes the most dividends. Every day, without fail, will make sure his wife takes the most dividends. But very often, forgets to do them for himself. Yeah. Mm, yes. Now, if he's not at his best, he can't help his wife live her best life as well. So you've got to treat yourself as if you're the boss of yourself as well. And it takes time. And then finally, you know, it's a fantastic book. It's very powerful, uh, very short read, but very powerful. It's called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It by Mal Ravikant. And he talks about, well, if I actually did love myself, or if I love someone, would I let someone I love 
uh, treat my setup like this? Mm. And very often the answer is no. You wouldn't put yourself through the same self-flagellation. You wouldn't put yourself through the same crap that you'd ask your best friend or your lover or your child to go through. Mm. So you've got to, it, and it takes time. And you can't do it when you're stressed. You can't do it in the middle of like, that round of 15 in Fran, when you drop the bar after nine trusters and start, you know, questioning all life decisions up to that point. That's not the time to start practicing positive self-talk. You practice it when you're in a calm state, and then you practice it when you're under a little bit more stress and a little bit more stress. Um, and it's a, it's a constant investment in yourself, but it's a constant investment that's worth it. Mm, it is. It, I think it's... Um you know, our, our, our mental health is, is a kind of an evolving thing and, you know, it's, it's, I, it's very disheartening when you see people getting down on themselves and all that kind of stuff. But you've given us some, uh, some really good kind of strategies there to kind of, uh, you know, take people out of that. Would you ever, um, you know, say a situation in the gym, you're coaching a class or you're just in the gym in general and you find one of your members talking negatively or whatever, you know, they're saying, I'm shit at this or... I, I'm crap at that, or you know, do, do you would you approach them and say, um, look, you, maybe you should change your talk or keep it to yourself or whatever it is. What way would you deal with um, members, and we've all had them over the years, um, that were you know that, that that don't very have a great opinion of themselves, we'd say, or you know they speak um, very negatively of themselves on a continuous basis. Um, so like, again, it's. It's easy to do it. It's easy to talk negative on yourself. Remember, most people complain. You know, the first thing you get out of people is, my God, the weather, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's too warm or it's too rainy or it's too cold or it's too windy. Um, you know, or we'll give out about the politicians because now we're in an election cycle. It's, yeah. it's, it's easy to do that. So if yes. anything's easy, it's probably not that beneficial for you. Uh, they we try and cultivate, and we're not always perfect with this, we try and cultivate a complaint-free zone, mm. so we don't complain and we make sure the coaches don't talk about, we don't say this workout is a tough one, we're like, this is the challenge of today's workout. So the challenge of today's workout is, how are you going to break up your world class? How we're going to solve this is, this This is what it's going to feel like and this is the benefit. And if we try and do that structure, it helps people. Um, now, also, if someone says they are bad at something, we can change it around by turning that into a past tense thing. So, I'm bad at front squats. Well, you can also say, is, I used to be bad at front squats, or I'm working on my front squats. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Turning it around. Um, you know, uh, we'll try and stop it. You know, other coaches have different strategies than me. They might just ignore negativity. So, mm. <laughs> when they people realize that complaining doesn't get them anywhere. We make a big deal out of demonstrating the gym values of being coachable, enthusiastic team players. You know, someone puts in effort extra and someone's positive and someone's grateful. We make a big deal out of that um, to try and reinforce the positive values. Again, if we can be the one positive hour in their life, that's awesome. And then hopefully that starts to push out into more and more of their life. Okay. That's good. I like that. I like... Um what you said about I can get better at it, you know, if someone says, oh, I'm shit at pull-ups, you could say to them, okay, um, how about we do some extra work on them or here's some accessory work or, you know, you, it, what, what did you used to be able to do and what can you do now so you could make them reflect back on the past and then maybe show them the present and then give them a guide into the future. I like that. I, like think, I think that would be a good strategy for things. Is, is what they're saying and what they're doing helpful or not? Yes, yeah. yes. It's, evil. it's a very, uh, I'm not a massive fan of hacks because they try and reduce something that's complicated down to one panacea that will fix everything. Mm. Uh, but like, there are, there are useful strategies provided you're, they're all part of a, a complete whole. So is this useful? Is this helpful? The way to go about it. Yeah. And uh, Colm, you spoke, just when you're speaking here, you kind of talk a lot about core values and kind of principles, kind of speaking. I know, I think we all kind of listen to um, Ben Bergeron's podcast and he kind of always yeah. has a list of something to go on about, which is really cool to me. Do you, is that something you use in the gym and then kind of, you can kind of attribute that to your mental health as well? Do you think there's like a particular three or four like core values that you'd use for your mental health and then, like you were saying in the gym too, for the members? Absolutely. So Ben Bergeron got that from Phil Jackson, who was the coach of the Chicago Bulls while uh, Jordan was there and then went on to the Lakers. Um, so his book is called 11 Rings, and that is 11 Championship Rings. And he got that from another book called Tribal Leadership. 
which is how you build uh, cohesive teams, particularly as any sort of team grows. Uh, so, yeah, core values are hugely important. Um, and again, it, it's part of defining your identity or your set of identities that what do I stand for? And then using that, that's a much better filter for well, what habits work, what habits do we want? So um, what we did is we looked at our best members and we said, what makes them special? And we came up that they were, it's literally written on the board here, the coachable, enthusiastic team players. And every week at our weekly team meeting, we used to go around the room and give examples of where one of the team members was showing an example of that. And so that keeps it forefront of our mind and it's written into our class reports. But that's because the, the value and the culture matter way more than the programming on the board or, you know, whether someone, you know, is toast of our or be up from that given day. Mm. Uh, that drives everything with us in the, in the gym here. Um, does it help with mental health? Absolutely. You've got to know what the values are because if you start changing your outer world, which is what everyone wants to do, mm. they want to fix their job, their relationships, their friends, their bank accounts, their fitness, their eating habits. But if you're doing that without a good filter of where am I coming from and where's my goal, you're just going to change habits and things willy-nilly, mm. which is a scientific term. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And um, in terms of self-care, Colm, um, could you like give us like a small, maybe daily strategy for, for us all, but in particular for anyone that is struggling with their uh, mental health and stuff like that? Is there like, okay, um, I need to get up, I need to start the morning routine then I maybe need to read some literature or whatever. Could you like lay out some kind of a small actionable plan that someone could take into their daily routine and uh, maybe just improve things just a little bit and head towards um, that better mental, mental health um, path? Yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Now, uh, this is what I coach people in. So the, mm. the four foundational practices before you start bringing it into your outer life are quiet time or clarity breaks, morning intentions, which is called self-compassion, gratitude, or finding the bright spots in the day, and then loving kindness practice, or wishing people well. So, uh, what, I, what I ask everyone to do when they start off is pick literally 60 seconds a day that's just for themselves. The reason behind that is, no one can argue that you don't have 60 seconds in a day. You might be able to say, well, I don't have 10 quiet minutes because uh, I have young kids and a busy job, and friends and the socialized and I want to watch the game, you know, um, there's all that. But everyone can take 60 seconds over their morning coffee or at the end of their morning commute just to sit in the car for themselves. Mm. What you're doing in those 60 seconds is you're just creating that little small sliver of light that can begin to illuminate what is going on in your life. I'm not asking you to picture fully unicorn dazzling light into your heart or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Just literally take the 60 seconds. That does uh, sound the reason nice, why though. it works so well is you're starting to tell your brain that you yourself are valuable. And what we tend to do is make everyone else in our life super valuable and we'll, you know, go down to the shops for someone and we'll do this and we'll bend over backwards and we'll wave a membership fee for someone else and then we'll let someone else away with a no rep and we'll do this and we'll pick up someone from the airport but we won't give ourselves a minute. So. When you start giving yourself a minute, you're starting to prove your value. Then we can start looking at, okay, what do you have the power to do that day that's going to make your life and everyone's life better, and that's setting your intentions. What's going good in your life? Because I promise you, like, if you're listening to this podcast, you have more going right with you than you have going wrong with you, but you have to train your brain to see it. Um, then you've got to start wishing people well, which gets you out of your own head and into how can you help the world, which makes you feel better. It's a nice virtuous cycle. In the evening, it's very important to close off the day with what went well and what you need to give yourself for. Now, I know that, I know you asked for one thing, and that's a lot, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to do all that at the start. In fact, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend literally decide right now, when can I take one minute a day for myself? Mm, that's good, man. That's good. That's really all good information. Um, I'm going to actually try some of that stuff myself. Um, I like the minute of the day. I might even try a little bit longer. And um, that minute of the try day... Minute, Tom. Try a minute. Try a minute, start off with. That minute, minute of the day, it can be done anywhere they feel like there's just a bit of peace and quiet, is it? Yeah, it's just that little bit of separation. And the first time it happens, you're going to notice a million thoughts pop into your head. And that's mm. fine. That's part of it. Mm. Uh, 
it's sometimes we often miss in these meditation courses, meditation apps, is that that is normal. You're going to hear a flood of thoughts come into your head, and that's fine, and you're going to get distracted. That is normal. The thing is that you've taken a minute, you're starting to notice these things. Yes, yes, absolutely. And in terms of um, our, our, our business, CrossFit, um, for the average CrossFitter that comes in and trains and whatnot, what can people, uh, they beat themselves up over the workouts and they get stressed and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're here to enjoy ourselves. So could you give um, our kind of clients or our general base a little bit of advice about their attitude towards training and their mental approach? Um, so there's, a, there's a running joke in our gym that every Tuesday, Sean would say, you're living the green bikes, where else would you rather be? And uh, it, it's a running joke, but it's very, very true. Yeah. If you're in a position where you can do CrossFit, again, you're in a very good position in life. Yes. Relatively speaking. I'm not saying you don't have problems. We all have problems. And I'm not discounting your problems and saying your problems aren't as big as someone in a war-torn country or suffering from you know, a terminal illness. But I'm not saying that. I want to be very clear on that. Mm. Our brain default to look for tracks because we... That's when they evolved. But we don't live in that environment now. So we've got to train ourselves to look pretty good. So it's important when someone comes in, they feel greeted, they feel secure, they feel safe. And that's where, you know, everything we do about how we're doing it as well. Um, most, a lot of our classes start with a breathing drill, which is a chance to get people to slow down for a second because, like you said, they're stressed. Then what we can do is give people small wins to boost their confidence throughout. Um, it's super important that we make a big deal out of them because most people dismiss their achievements. They'll spend ages going over their failures, but they won't spend any time going over their achievements. And you just sort of slowly, slowly turn the lens around on that. So, hey, any day you're training is a good day. Mm. Any day you're getting a sweat is a good day. Um, you might not always get PRs, and that's just the education around that as well. But that's a uh, that's what we can do in the gym. And then we can do, you know, shout out to people, highlight people, ask people what they're grateful for as well, create that culture. Brilliant, brilliant. I, I love that. I love the way uh, your buddy said um, you're living the dream, you know, and if you are, if you're training away and uh, you have your health and all that kind of stuff, you are living the dream. You know, there's a lot worse places to be in the world and a lot worse circumstances. As you said, Absolutely. we all have our, our uh, crosses to bear. But we're in here and we're moving and we're, we're surrounded by positive, happy people. So uh, I think that's a big win. And then in terms of, because there will be a lot of the guys um, listening to this, and um, obviously I'm one and you're one, in terms of the gym owners, um, you know, we are living the dream, but it's not always, sometimes it can be a bit of a nightmare, as you know. Um, so what would you advise um, um, us, us gym owners and our micro box owners and box owners and all that, could you give any helpful advice to us guys in terms of, um, you know, uh, improving our mental health and just keeping us positive? And because, um, like you said before, um, if we're yeah, absolutely. We're yeah, no, what I'm saying is like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, hang on, buddy. Just as we were there. No, back sorry, idea. sorry, Carl. You just froze there for one second. So go back, go back to the start <laughs> no there sorry. again. <laughs> go uh, what I'm saying is a lot of reasons why people um, dislike the whole idea of "I'll oh, get yourself around positive." It's it's not you're not being blind to the realities of the situation. You know, you're able to look at something with well, what objectively is it? Is it a, a three thousand euro bill or is it a thirty thousand euro bill? Mm. Are you out of training for two weeks or are you out of training for two months? It's looking at it objectively and then saying, okay, well what can we do rather than wallowing in, oh well my shoulder's gone, so there goes my open, you know, I'm mm. gonna only finish ten thousand in the world versus forty thousand in the world. <laughs> now you mentioned gym owners and uh, yes. gym owners are worse because we want to help people so much. Mm. And but what happens is we get disconnected from a lot of what makes people mentally healthy and mentally happy. Uh, this all comes from Johan Harry's book, Lost Connections. We, we create this awesome community for people to have that sense of connection and sense of achievement, but we're disconnected from it because we are constantly looking at, oh, is the class running on time and the barbells need cleaning, oh, I've got to replace that. We're disconnected probably from our family and friends because we're trying to start up the business and I know I was and I'm working on repairing and rebuilding those relationships now. Uh, you know, you're spending morning, noon and night and Sundays even in the gym. Mm. 
Uh, and you're disconnected from a financial secure future as well because you're taking this this risk as well. So those three things add up. And because we're business, uh, because of the type of business we're in, we always want to help people. So we'll always say yes to our clients, we'll always say yes to our coaches, we'll always say yes to the bank demands or our mm-hmm. suppliers. Um, so this is why it's super important that you do actually build yourself up first because you're going to keep giving and keep giving and keep giving. And if you're not purposely replenishing that tank, you're going to run out of steam. Either you're going to start getting grumpy in front of your clients, you're going to snap at your spouse, or look, people are going to notice the energy that you once had isn't there. Mm. You're not as enthusiastic for teaching air squats and double unders anymore. So that's why it's so important to fill yourself up first. It's not selfish, it's self full So that's why taking that initial time in the morning, provided you're not like a 5.30 a.m. coach and you have to get up at 2 to do this, mm. but taking that initial time in the morning to charge your batteries, but for me, that is taking the morning coffee and sitting quietly and doing my gratitude practice and my mindfulness, and then having a stretch. And then it's like, right, now I can, you know, I can give for the rest of the day because I know I'm topped up. Mm. Um, and that can be, yeah, okay, I'm going to make sure I have the time for my training, but also I'm going to switch off my phone during training. I'm not going to worry about you know, any calls or any, any red alarms, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, gym owners tend to be... And they give so much and it's admirable, it's totally admirable. But mm-hmm. unless you're topping yourself up, you're not going to be able to give as much as you, as you want to. And you're not going to be able to help people live the lives you want them to live. Yeah, I agree, man, 100%. Um, I've seen it, I'm, I'm, I know you've seen it over the years, over our decade in uh, the business. Um, if the, the gym owner is happy, then the place tends to run better, doesn't it? I know that when I've been unhappy over the last decade, then things have slided in here. And the happier I am and the more settled I am, the better the place runs. And absolutely. And uh, like, 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 uh, like the client who wants to come in and lose 50 kilos or needs to lose 50 kilos, mm. it's a process and it takes time. You lose one kilo and two kilos and you might slip back. The same with building your business. You might be able to extract yourself from coaching every hour and give another coach their chance to grow and shine. Mm. Your revenue might go up and down as well. As long as you're stepping back enough to see it trending and it's moving in the right direction at the pace you're comfortable at, that's mm. really good. And that's the same with your mental health. If you're noticing that you had a million negative thoughts in the day and now you've only 999,999, that's one last thought. Mm. Ultimately, you'll start to notice that you are more optimistic, more self-assured, um, more productive, more peaceful. All the great stuff that we all deserve. Brilliant, brilliant. That's excellent, Carl. Um, we, go, we covered a huge amount today, buddy. I think we even covered more than yesterday, which is good. The Lost <laughs> Podcast. Um, I'm absolutely delighted you came on. I'm really pleased with it and uh, really appreciate it. Um, so you've talked about all these strategies and stuff like that today. Um, if someone wants to get in contact with you and maybe talk some more about it and um, get some more advice, um, how can they contact you? Um, easiest way, probably, I know we talked about social media, but I'm on there for hey. pretty much. If you look Slide up them DMs. on Facebook or Instagram, you can message me personally, Colin O'Reilly, on um, any media, Colin at mentalhealthplan.com. You can actually go in and book a uh, complimentary call with me as well on that site as well. So brilliant, any brilliant. Of those places. Yeah, you're doing fantastic work, buddy. Absolutely fantastic. Um, is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to now before we wrap things up? Um, I mean, like my coaches support me, so I can do that. My clients are fantastic. I've given Derek, um, Patrick, or PJ, to give him his nickname, and uh, and Jamie a lot of shout outs. And um, I will say, I had a conversation with Brunel years ago, and he was talking about how he was noticing, you know, guys, guys suffering, and that was what initially prompted me to write the story of my suicide attempt when I was seventeen. So. I'm not sure if Alan actually knows that uh, he was a catalyst in kicking this off, but Brilliant. he's a good dude as well. So yeah, um, he is. He's a good boy. Up. So I guess the I guess the point behind uh, raising Alan is you never know the power a conversation can have with someone and mm. what direction it can have. So if you have the chance to have a genuine conversation and help get past the normal day to day chit chat and help someone do it because it can have a massive effect on the world. Brilliant, Colin. Well said. Well said. Um, again, thank you very much for coming on. 
Uh, we probably could have gone, gone in for longer again. I, I wonder, would you come on maybe in six months again and we could touch base and have another chat? First, third time. Well, I'll need it recorded. Hey, I promise it will be. I promise it will be. All right. Thanks again for calling so Sunday morning, Carl. And um, you have a great weekend. And I'll talk Brilliant. to you soon, buddy. Thanks again. Thanks, Carl. Thank See Good you luck. Again, Brilliant. We got it. Mm -hmm. Hey. It's recorded. <laughs> Second time lucky. <laughs> Two time guest in 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. That was very interesting, man, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Colin's insights are brilliant. He's very mm. educated on the subject matter he talks about, whether it be like the gym and, or just the mental health side of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can see the amount of time that he spent yeah. like investing in himself and his mental health and then obviously reading up on things mm. and educating himself on how to pass it on to everyone else. I think Tonar's thing, uh, uh, Tonar is fantastic. He has a different approach. It's a little bit yeah. more rough and ready where Carl is like strategies and all that mm. kind of stuff. Shout out to Mark. Um, but both um, super advocates for the mental health side. Yeah, of and it's great to see it in our sport just in Ireland. And yeah. I know <clears throat> it's a very large sport on a scale as in America and mm. whatever around the world, but like Ireland's so small. And we have two mental health advocates already. Brilliant, brilliant. You know, we don't really get that in many places. Um, and then if anyone didn't hear what Carl really said there um, about where to find him, it's at the mental health plan on mm. Instagram and Facebook. And he puts up basically daily content, I'd say, um, two to three minute videos mm. on Facebook. They're a bit longer as well. And then he's always up to a message as well. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, folks, that's a wrap for episode number 13. Um, thanks to our sponsor, Hit Coffee, and also for Andy and Colm for coming on. Next week, we have uh, the most sanctioned man in the whole world, I think. Uh, yeah. Mr. Sam Stewart is coming on. They actually named Sam the most electrifying man in CrossFit. Did it? Uh, up on the 5150. There's two American guys that were doing brilliant. that. Brilliant, brilliant. Two guys from Loud and Live that were doing the, the MC in up the 5150. Every time they announced Sam, the most electrifying man The most man electrifying in man. He's doing well. Shout out to Sam. He's yeah. doing well over in uh, Sid there. Yeah. Throwing down with the big dogs. He's I in can't... the same heat as Fraser. Yeah, that's Brilliant right. He's alongside yeah. him. He's only, a, he's only a few reps behind him. Uh, he he bet the, the time, BFG right? there on yeah, one of the workouts did. as well. <laughs> yeah. Big Zach. Shout out to Zach George. We're still waiting for that uh, contact us to come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it'll be good to talk to him now next week. Yeah, uh, exactly. Interesting Brilliant. to see what he says about Sid and all the other sanctions and the ones he has planned for the rest of the year. I'm sure he's doing one every couple of weeks till uh, December, so uh, we'll get <laughs> yeah. to chat to him about that. All right, that's a wrap for episode 13. And we'll be back with episode 14 next week with Sam Stewart. Until then, look after that mental health.